So now we'll look at some of the other important properties of simple harmonic oscillators. And certainly one of the important ones is a property called the amplitude. The amplitude, for, let, me, let me say first of all, all oscillators have a number of different displacements. That is to say that they go back and forth around some fixed position. So there's any number. There's really an infinite number of displacements. But there is one particular displacement that is very important. And that is the one where they reach their maximum displacement. So let me give you an example of, let's use the guitar string. So for the guitar string, there is some maximum displacement from equilibrium. So the natural equilibrium position is where the string is stationary. And as you pull that string out, you can pull it out any number of places, and as you allow the string to be let go, the string is going to go back and forth, and there will be lots and lots of displacements. I could draw lots of lines for the other positions where the string will temporarily be at, but the most important one for our case, for our understanding, is going to be the place where it's at its maximum. So there is the maximum displacement from equilibrium, not from maximum to maximum. That would actually be double the amplitude. I can give you another example, and that would be the pendulum. So we set the pendulum in motion. Here's the equilibrium position. Here is the extreme displacement. So from equilibrium to the point at which you have displaced it the furthest, that is referred to as the amplitude. Now, in our book, we're mostly going to refer to it as A, but it is very common for it to be referred to as X0. And the reason for that is that obviously displacement is frequently uh, characterized, or the symbol used for it is X. And in this case, it's not required, and certainly not all simple harmonic oscillators follow this. But oftentimes, a simple harmonic oscillator is started in motion by pulling it out to the side. So you can imagine that if you pulled it all the way out to the side and let go, that point where you let go could be referred to as the initial displacement. And X0 is commonly the term used for the initial displacement. Now, you don't have to do that. There are ways to get simple harmonic oscillators to begin moving without pulling them out to their extreme position. But because it is so common, you oftentimes will see X0. So in some books, they'll say A for the amplitude. In other books, they may say X0. But it means the same thing, the maximum displacement from equilibrium. A second really important property, and this relates to the um, period of time that it takes for the object to, to move through is the angular frequency. This is sometimes also called the angular speed or the angular velocity. And it is simply the number of radians that an oscillator moves through per unit time. So let me draw a displacement time graph. So simple displacement time graph. And typically, most oscillators are started by being at their extreme position. Again, that would be the amplitude. They're then released. So this right there would be A. That's the amplitude. And what ultimately ends up happening is that the, as you release the oscillator, the displacement decreases as the restoring force pulls it back towards equilibrium. It overshoots the equilibrium position to the other side where the restoring force brings it to a stop and then the restoring force pulls it back towards the equilibrium position where it overshoots once again and the restoring force brings it to a stop on the other extreme and so this period of time that it takes to go from one extreme to the other remember is called the period that amount of time that it takes to go from maximum amplitude all the way over to the other side and back to the same maximum amplitude, or maximum displacement, I should say, the amplitude, that's referred to as the period of time, the, the, the period, I should say. So how does this have to do with, with radians? Well, if you think about circular motion, let's draw a circle. And if you imagine an arm swinging around at some speed, then obviously over some period of time some angle will be swept out. That is to say that every second this arm will swing out some number of 
either degrees or in this case we really want to start thinking about um, angles in terms of the, the number of radians. So if we had one full cycle, I'm sure everyone remembers that one full cycle in degrees, that would be 360 degrees, but if you were measuring it in radians, that would be 2 pi radians, 2 pi radians, or approximately 6.28 radians. Okay, and let's use the symbol for angle theta. We're talking about angular measures. So if you think about and, and it may not be completely clear, so I really want to kind of clarify it. It's not specific to this particular topic, but I know radians can be a little bit confusing at times. So if you think about this object swinging all the way around through one complete circle, then obviously we would be talking about the path along the outside would be the circumference, and then this point from the center to the outward portion is called the radius. Well, there's a simple formula for figuring out how far that you've traveled as you move around a circular track and that is that s, the distance around this, is equal to theta measured in radians times r. And you might wonder where this formula came from. If you've never seen it before, this essentially is a simple proportionality because imagine that we had the full circumference of the circle. What if we had the full circumference of the circle? Well, in that case, the full circumference would be 2 pi times r, and that would be equal to theta times r. What we end up seeing is that r cancels out, and in that case, the angle that we're talking about would be 2 pi. And this is where the idea of there being 2 pi radians in one full circle um, comes from. So we'd have theta equal to 2 pi. And the reason why I point that out is because radians are, are certainly a tricky thing. I think most people have difficulty with it, but in science it's even maybe that much trickier because we really have to deal with this issue of units. And the reality is that angles measured in radians are not considered essentially to have units because the origin of the idea of radians comes from this idea of the angular measure related to the distance that you travel around a circle and so this way of measuring um, angles ultimately derives from a formula in which the properties that have units, r, actually cancel each other out. So r could be measured in any units, meters or centimeters, but it won't make a difference because they'll be canceled out on both sides. Pi has no units and neither does the number 2. So this is considered to not have any units and that's really important because as you can see the definition for angular frequency is the number of radians that an oscillator moves through per unit time. So omega is equal to theta over t. That is to say the angle that you move through per unit time. Problem with that is that radians are not considered to be a unit. So when you say the angular frequency, it would be very common for people to say radians per second. But technically radians is not a unit. So ultimately the real units for angular frequency are inverse seconds. Now hopefully that sounds familiar because we just saw in the last part, let me bring it back, that the units for this constant in the simple harmonic formula, or simple harmonic motion equation, A equals minus some constant times the displacement, that that constant had units of inverse second squared very close to what we have right here. And it does turn out that that missing constant is the, the angular frequency squared. Obviously this would not be the same units. So if we square the angular frequency, we get the right units, and that is the right property to fill in for C. And we'll do that in just, a, in just a moment. But for right now, what I really would like to leave with is, what if we were talking about one full cycle of motion? One full cycle, one full time around the circle. Well, that time, T, actually has a special name. And that allows us to develop 
a relationship that's going to allow us a, essentially a method for calculating omega by measuring another property, that property being that property being the period. The period is usually pretty easy to measure. I mean, oftentimes you can do it with a stopwatch or you could use photo gates. There are other devices you can use, but typically the period is relatively easy in a simple harmonic oscillator to measure. And so in that case, if you think about the period of time, how much of the cycle do we go through in the course of one full period? Well, that would obviously be two pi. By definition, because the period is the time to make one full cycle, you would therefore go through two pi radians in that full cycle, and then that would be divided by the, the period. This relates two of the most important properties of simple harmonic oscillators, the period of its motion and the angular frequency that, the operator, that it operates at. So let's look at a related, very similar related property called the frequency of the object's motion. And where the angular frequency was with the radians per unit time, the frequency is the number of full cycles per unit time. So very, very similar property. It's symbolized by lowercase. And essentially, if you think about this, the frequency is the inverse of the period. It's the inverse of the period. The period is the time for the object to complete one full cycle, whereas the frequency is the number of cycles per unit time. The amount of time to go around once, the number of cycles to go through one full unit of time. These guys are inverse, just pure inverses of each other. I don't think you'll see a much simpler equation in physics than the equation for frequency, the inverse of the, of the period. So what must be the units? The units for this guy? Well, obviously, the units essentially are cycles per second. But again, much in the same way as radians are not considered to be a, um, a unit in and of itself, similarly, cycles are not considered to be a unit. It's, it's a counter, basically. So it doesn't have units of its own. And this is going to lead to another unit of inverse seconds. Now that would be confusing because obviously we just looked at angular frequency. It also had units of inverse seconds. But fortunately, there's something that's going to help us out a little bit. And that is that when we talk about the, this, the, the regular frequency as opposed to angular frequency, we give it another name. And an inverse second, only in terms of frequency, cycles per unit time, is called a hertz. And the abbreviation for that is H little z. So let me give you an example of how this one would work. If, for example, you had an object whose period was 0 0.035 seconds. So this is an object that's going back and forth very rapidly. It's, it's going back and forth in far less than one second, few thousandths of a, of a second. Then we would calculate its frequency by taking 1 over t. That would be 1 divided by 0 0.035 and that comes out to about 285, or in this case, 2.9 times 10 to the second hertz. So th this is very helpful because they do technically have essentially the same units. They both operate on inverse seconds, but this one is given a special name that helps to distinguish it from the angular frequency. So it should be a little bit more clear. It's pretty rare for frequency to be stated in inverse seconds. It is almost virtually always um, stated with units of, of hertz. But you have to recognize that these units of hertz would be replaced with inverse seconds. So let's go ahead and summarize everything. There's, there's actually quite a bit that we've covered, and we, we've gone through most of the basics of simple harmonic motion. So from this point, we'll, we'll simply kind of apply these to specific oscillators to see how they, um, how they are addressed for that particular one using these general rules that we've just established. Most important one is the equation for simple harmonic motion. This is the definition of simple harmonic motion.
and that is that the acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x. Again, the important aspects of simple harmonic motion is that the acceleration is directly proportional to, but opposite, to the displacement of the object. Okay. Now before we connect this equation to some of the other equations that we've just um, created, sorry, there we go. Let's take a look at um, how this looks graphically because this again, remember, is the equation of a line. So if we we were to graph this, remember this is y equals mx and there's no y-intercept. So if we put a to represent the y variable and x to represent the, the x variable of the independent axis, you think about what the shape of this graph must look like. It does form the shape of a straight line but not a straight line moving from the origin upward to the right because it has a negative slope. So instead what we would see is something that looks like this. line would be equal on both sides of the origin and this point right here would represent capital A or I'm sorry X naught it would represent the maximum displacement because this is the point at which it's displaced and the oscillator essentially goes like this we pull it out to the right and if you could imagine this graph in motion what we would essentially see is the oscillator being pulled back towards equilibrium, overshooting, going to the maximum negative position, coming to a stop, and then being pulled back towards the equilibrium position again, overshooting, going back, and then essentially this graph, if we could see it over time, what we would see is the oscillator going back and forth, back and forth, where not only do the displacement increase or decrease from their positive to negative maximum values, but you could say the same thing for the acceleration. So the maximum acceleration occurs where the displacement is maximized. That would be at this position and then also at this position right here. Maximum positive displacement, maximum negative acceleration. Maximum positive acceleration, maximum maximum negative uh, displacement. Okay, so this graph reveals quite a bit, but here's a, like a really a, probably a more important aspect of this graph, and the reason why we would want to look at this graph is not so much to um, establish a and x, but instead to come up with the value for omega. So omega in this case the slope equals not omega, not omega, because remember it's a equals minus omega squared x, so the slope of this graph is actually omega squared. So if you were, for example, to take the any value, any point along this graph, I mean obviously the easiest point is to pick the, one of the maximums, but it would work for any point. If you pick a point along here and calculate the slope of this graph, it's going to give you the square of the angular frequency and then obviously all you would need to do is to square root it and you would have omega. And why would you want omega? Because omega is related to another important property of the simple harmonic oscillator, and that is the period of its motion. So if you could get omega through some manner, this graph being one of those ways, then you could determine the period. If you knew what the period was, you could then figure out what the frequency of its motion is or how many hertz that that object is oscillating at. It can work in reverse also. If you could come up with the frequency by some manner, you could work out the period. If you knew the period, then you could work out the angular frequency and with the angular frequency you can establish the equation for simple harmonic motion for that particular oscillator, whatever that oscillator happens to be. Whether it's a, a pendulum or a, a spring on a mass, a mass on a spring I should say, or a marble in a bowl or any of the simple harmonic oscillators that we looked at. So the connection between these three are general things that are governed by all simple harmonic oscillators and there are a few more general equations we'll look at
but ultimately our goal over the next few parts is to take these equations and then connect them to specific oscillators and we will focus on the pendulum and the mass on a spring as our two most important oscillators.